All right, well, let's turn in the Bible to Proverbs. I wanted to talk tonight about um, three things that, uh, if we're going to run around and call ourselves Christians, as we have the new year starting off here, three things that we as Christians need to be doing, and it's three things that I'm excited about that we're going to be doing here at Impact. So go to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1 says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Now, if you look at the original uh, Hebrew here, it's not talking about being famous. It's not talking about um, being popular necessarily. It's talking about when it says a good name is more desirable than riches. The good name is your reputation. Now you have to be careful because I love this quote. I stumbled, I stumbled across it um, a couple of weeks ago and I, I thought it was fantastic. It says, um, your reputation is what others say about you. Your character is who God says you are. And that really hit home for me because you can put on a front, you can put on a show, you can fool people and you can have a great rep, right? You can have a great reputation. Oh, she's wonderful. Oh, they're wonderful. But the truth is what your character is and what you do when nobody's watching, what you do when nobody's going to know any different, what you think when nobody's going to see those thoughts but God, uh, what pours out of your heart that nobody knows but you and God. That's your true character. And there's a lot of people that do a great job of building a good rep, but truth be told, they have terrible character. And so that's what this is talking about here in Proverbs. It's talking about having true character that not just you have a good reputation, but your acts and the things that you say and the things that you do prove to everybody that you have a good name. Everybody knows how you are, not because what you tell them you are. You know, if you have to keep reminding somebody that you're really, really funny... You're probably not very funny. You know, I'm the funniest guy you ever meet. I tell great jokes. If you have to tell people that all the time, then you probably don't have great jokes. So it's about having true character. Now, how do you get to that true character? Well, you know, it's easy for the world to define character, but we're, we're not really caring about what the world considers good character at impact. We want to be concerned about what does God say is good character and how do we get there. So let's look at Mark, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look at Mark chapter 12. And we're picking up in verse 38. Mark 12 verse 38. As he taught, Jesus said, Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplaces. They have the most important seats in the synagogues and the place of honor at banquets. Those dudes have a reputation, right? Oh, here comes a Pharisee. Here comes a scribe. Here comes one of the Sadducees. They have the best places. It's the dude that, you know, you ever watched an NBA game and there's people on the floor at the NBA game and you think, I wonder how they got those tickets. How much did that cost? You know, it's always some celebrity that's sitting there, you know, and it's on the, they're like they can touch the players as they check into the game and stuff. And I've often wondered, how do they get those tickets and how much did it cost them? And the reality is most of the time, it probably didn't cost them anything because their reputation and their fame, somebody's probably giving them the tickets. Because it does good for that team. You know, if you're the Clippers, it does good for the Clippers for their own TV and there's three movie stars on the front row. It's going to draw a crowd. It's going to make people want to watch the games. It's going to people say, I want to be a Clippers fan. My favorite movie star is a Clippers fan. I want to be a Clippers fan and that kind of stuff. So, there's... And I was picking up the panels of the, you know, this, I don't know if y'all know this or not, but this floor just snaps right up. I mean, it's like a puzzle piece because it goes right back down. And I was snapping the pieces of the puzzle back in. And I reached over and I picked up one that needed to be put back into place. And when I picked it up, underneath it was a piece of bacon. <laughs> and I thought, when was the last time we had bacon in this kitchen? Because <laughs> I know I hadn't had any bacon in that kitchen in a long time. 
And I'm thinking, Thanksgiving maybe? Has that piece of bacon been hiding out in there since Thanksgiving? I don't know. But anyways, uh, if we don't have any cheese, but there is a slice of bacon. Not a slice, but a small piece in the bottom of the trash can in there. So these guys, they got at the table by their reputation. Uh, and just pick up there in verse 40. They devour widows' houses... And for show, make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. So Jesus is saying, these guys have the rep. Look, they get the best seats at the ball games. People give them tickets. They want them to be there. They got a great reputation. Every time they walk down the streets, people go, oh, they're so-and-so. He's, he's awesome. But the reality is, Jesus said they steal money. They're robbing houses from the widows. And they get out in front of people and they put on a show. They make these big lengthy prayers and everybody thinks they're the greatest people of God in the history of the world. But behind the scenes, they're robbing widows. And the reality is it says that these men will be punished most severely. So if we want to get to the character that God describes as uh, what matters and get past the reputation, we have to become a true disciple of Christ. There's a big difference between willing to be a believer and being a willing disciple. You know, we think if somebody comes up to you and they say, hey, are you a disciple of Christ? Every Christian would say, yes, I am. But if you look at the definition of a disciple, that definition is different than a believer. See, if I told you uh, this new diet that, that somebody's doing, it works. And you're going to lose 100 pounds in, a, in three months in a healthy way if you try it. And you see people losing 100 pounds in three months and they look incredible. You would be a believer. You would say, hey, I believe that that diet works. I see that it's working. If I take paint and put it on the wall and say it's going to turn it white and it turns it white, you can look at it and say, I believe it. It's turning it white. But believing that that diet works doesn't help you lose weight. Believing that the wall is going to turn white doesn't make you a painter. You've seen the results of it. You've seen it in action. You believe it to be true, but it hasn't changed the way you live your life. It hasn't affected you. And so the difference between being a, a believer and a disciple is once you believe that that diet works, you start participating in the diet. Once you believe that Jesus is the Messiah and He can forgive you of your sins, once you believe that and ask Him into your heart, the believing part has been accomplished. But you're not a disciple yet. The disciple comes when you start following His teachings and trying to live the way He wants you to live. Then the believer becomes the disciple. That's why if you read the Bible, it says His disciples were with Him. Well, he had crowds of 5,000 around him at times. Many of them were strong believers. They believed that they believed that they believed that this man was the Messiah. They followed him everywhere he went because they believed he was the Messiah. But they were not referred to as his disciples because they weren't learning and following and acting in the way that Jesus was telling them to do. He was teaching those disciples specifically, here's how you act. Here's how you handle this. He was teaching them. It like, just like if you go and take up karate uh, or one of the martial arts and you become a disciple of that discipleship. You're learning how to put that into your life, how to use those self-defense mechanisms. You're learning how to implement it in your life. Now, I can believe that karate works, but it doesn't make me a black belt, Right? But once you start acting like a disciple and following Christ, you become the black belt. And it doesn't happen overnight, right? First you get the gold belt, and then the purple belt, and then a brown belt, and you work your way up until eventually you are a strong, mature Christian. But that doesn't happen overnight. Salvation is instant. Discipleship is a process. Nobody becomes a great disciple the moment they get saved. Does everybody follow what I'm saying there? So I would ask you this. We're going to start a discipleship class here at Impact. And just answer to yourself, am I a believer or am I a disciple? And if I'm not a disciple yet, don't I want to get there? And if I am a disciple, where am I on the spectrum of disciple? Where would you say I am on that spectrum? Am I a new beginner? If they gave out belts, would I be a black belt in Jesus or would I be gold belt would I just have my white robe I may have told you all this before I took up karate in like the third grade or something and uh, 
I'm in this karate class, and you know, they're learning how, you learn how to stand and how to punch and how to defend yourself. And I went there for like a week, maybe three, and I didn't know it, but that was the free part of the karate class, is you get three weeks for free or something like that. And so um, the guy, the sensei or whatever at the end of the class one day, he says, all right, everybody that comes back Monday, uh, we're going to do something, and if you pass the test, you're going to get your, they, it wasn't a gold belt, they called it the yellow belt, the yellow belt. So you get your gold, though you, instead of the white robe, you know, you got a, a yellow belt to go around instead of your white one. He said, you get your yellow belt. And so I get back in the car, and we're going home, and I said, Mom, I can't wait till Monday. I'm going to get my gold belt or yellow belt, whatever it was. And she said, well, honey, we're not going back. And I said, why not? And she said, because the free part's over on Monday to get your yellow belt. It costs $300. And I was like, aww. So I never got my yellow belt. You know, Yellow belts cost $300. So where are you on the spectrum as a disciple? Do you have the yellow belt? Do you have the black belt? Well, if you want to get to the black belt, uh, the discipleship class is going to be there. All right, so discipleship, that's something we're excited about. Number two, uh, let's look at James chapter 4. So if you're in Mark, head towards Revelation. James is right before 1 Peter. It's after Hebrews. And we're at James chapter 4. Picking up in verse 13. How long does water bottle last? Does anybody know? I've been sipping on this for like two months. <laughs> I'll let you know. When I get a stomach virus I'll let, or a bug, bacteria, I'll let you know it's good for two and a half months. You'll know then. So chapter 4, verse 13. <clears throat> Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow will go to this, to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why do you not even know what will happen? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, it is the Lord, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or do that. As it is... You boast and you brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Have you ever been guilty? You don't have to raise your hand. Have you ever been guilty of knowing what the right thing to do is and you don't do that? Because I've done that before. I have known in my heart that this is the right thing to do. And for whatever reason, whether it was pride or selfishness or anger or bitterness, whatever, I didn't do it. Well, this tells me right here I was sinning. And before that, it says that you don't know if you're going to be around tomorrow. You don't know how much time you've got left. And so, what are you going to do with tomorrow? See, to be a disciple, to do things in God's kingdom, it takes effort and it takes time. How will you spend tomorrow? Look at Hebrews chapter 10. If you're in James, just back up a few pages. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Two things there. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Well, let me ask you this. If all we ever do is come to church on Sunday and Wednesday, especially if all we ever do is come to church on Sunday, and you come in and you worship and sing two or three songs, and then you listen to me or whoever's speaking talk for 30 or 45 minutes, and then you go home and go to supper tonight or lunch Sunday or whatever, how in the world does doing that allow you to encourage other people in the body to do good deeds? Because there's really not a time in there for that, is there? I mean, think about Sunday mornings. You come in, we sing worship music, I talk, we go home. Right? You're either teaching kids out there, you're in here listening, or you're up here singing. Nothing wrong with any of that. But where is there any place in there for you to encourage other people towards love and good deeds? See, this is something that should happen away from Sunday and Wednesdays. 
this should happen in small groups. And we're going to start up small groups. Small groups are going to start up in February. This is an opportunity where Lauren can be in a group of believers in a small group studying something that she wants to study and has some interest in, and she can encourage that, those people in that small group to do good works, to do good deeds, to do acts of love. Because on Sunday mornings, that's hard for anybody to do. Unless you're up here talking, you can say it. Does everybody follow that? So we're going to start small groups. And it's with the purpose that we can encourage one another to do good works and good deeds outside of Sundays and Wednesdays. And, on top of that, it says, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. This meeting together, the new Christians, if you go back and look at the book of Hebrews, and when it was written, the new church, as it was starting, people were going to church. They were going to the synagogue twice a day, and then they would go and meet in somebody's house at night. Every day there was a meeting in somebody else's house. And they would get together in big groups and small groups. And that's how the church started and started to grow. And, hey, we're going over to Martha's house tonight. And everybody that could would show up at Martha's house. And if Martha's house wasn't big enough for everybody, then they would go to somebody's house that was bigger the next time as the, the group would grow. But this tells us right here to not to forsake that, to keep meeting and to get together, small groups, big groups, whatever. So we're going to start up small groups in February. And then the last thing, um, let's look at Psalm, the book of Psalms. Look at Psalm chapter 66. And that's back in the Old Testament, right before Proverbs, after Job. Psalms is easy to find. It's about right in the middle of the Bible and it's huge. Psalm 66, and we're picking up in verse 18. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Think about that for a second. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Now, again, it's important to understand what the words in the Bible actually mean and not just gloss over them. Everybody sitting in here has sinned before. So this is not saying if you have sinned, the Lord won't listen. It says, if I had cherished sin in my heart. So that's past tense. That's if I, if I had kept the sin in my heart and cherished it and held on to it. You know, if you cherish something, you want it. You don't want to give it up. You love it. You're going to hold it close. You're going to keep an eye on it. You know, uh, when Nolan was three years old, I wouldn't say, Nolan, go outside and play. I'll see you later and lock him out. I would have never let him out of my sight on purpose when he was three years old, right? I'm scared something would happen to him. So if you cherish something, you're going to be close to it. You're going to protect it. You're going to keep your eye on it. Well, if you cherish sin, if there's something sinful in your life and you cherish it and love it and don't want to part with it, then it says, God wouldn't listen. So you have to get that sin out of there so that he will listen. And then kind of building on that, just back up a few pages to Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. So verse chapter uh, 66 tells us that if we get rid of the sin in our heart then he'll listen. This tells us in verse 15 of chapter 34 that his ears are attentive to their cry. Well, what is he listening to and what is he attentive to? Us talking at the dinner table? Us talking a water cooler talk about our, our favorite uh, bowl win of the season or something? No, he's talking about when we pray. When we pray, if we'll clean the sin out of our heart and pray... He'll listen. If we will pray and we're doing what he's asking us to do, then he'll be attentive. Think about the power of that that he's telling us right there in two simple verses. If we'll get sin out of our heart and kneel before him and pray, he will be attentive and listen. You have God's attention when you pray. If you're doing it the right way. 
Think how powerful that is. Sometimes I can't get Trisha's attention. Sometimes she can't get mine. Sometimes you probably can't get your, somebody in your family's attention, right? They never listen to me. You never listen. You ever said that to somebody? <laughs> you don't ever listen. I've told you three times. How about if you say, hey God, I got something to say, and immediately God's eyes are on you and his ears are open, and he says, what is it? God. Well, that's what it says. It says his eyes are on us and his ears are listening. That's pretty powerful. So we're going to have a prayer vigil. Uh, I tell you, I am not perfect in any way, shape, or form. And sometimes I drop the ball and screw up. And one major mistake that I made in 2017 was we did not have a two a all night prayer vigil. We did one in 2016, and I stood up here and said, "We're not going to be the church that has one of these and then never has it ever again." And I let 2017 come and go, and we never had another one. Now we had one plan and it got messed up, but it's my responsibility to make sure those things happen. And I dropped the ball on that. And I owe y'all an apology for that. And we're going to fix that. Because sometime soon, we're going to have a prayer vigil. And we're going to do an all-nighter like we did last time. And you can sign up for an hour block. And you can come and pray. And we'll have the prayer wall up in the trailer. And you can write prayer requests on there so that when you leave, the next person that comes in can look at that wall and pray for whatever you've put on there. And so there'll be teams that are coming in all night long. And we'll start it on Saturday night. And we'll pray until 10 o'clock Sunday morning when service starts or 1030. And we'll have an all night prayer thing. And that's an important thing to start this 2018 year on the right foot. And let's finish in 1 John. So go back to the New Testament. If you go back towards James. And we're going to be in 1 John chapter 5. After James is Peter, First and Second Peter, and then you get 1 John. Right before Jude and Revelation. It's hard to find. It's a small book. First John chapter 5, and we're in verse 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And that's what we want to do. Whatever we've got on our hearts as an individual, as a, our family, as a church family, as the body of Christ, we're going to go into that prayer vigil and we're going to go before Him in confidence, approaching God, asking Him things according to His will. And we're promised right there that He will hear us. I mean, if, uh, if there's anything in this world that is discouraging you or you feel bad about, I would just remind you of three things that we just read. If you get sin out of your heart, God will listen. If you pray to Him, He will look at you and open His ears and pay attention. And this tells us right here that if we ask it according to His will, He will hear us. It doesn't say He may, He could, He possibly hear us. It says if we ask it anything according to His will, He hears us. Present tense, happening right now, period. No discussion. He hears us. That is a powerful thing to know that our God has his ears open, his eyes on us, and he's hearing our prayer request. And God doesn't hear a prayer request and go, hey, that's a pretty good request. And then move on. He's going to act. He's going to move. All right, let's pray, and then you guys can go home. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight. We pray for those who couldn't be here again. Lord, we lift up those that we specifically name by name to start with. Lord, we pray that you'll be with us as we go through discipleship. We have a great group of people that come here, Lord. The people that come here on a regular basis love you and they want to serve you. And we just pray that you'll pour your Holy Spirit upon them so that they can grow in discipleship. Lord, we pray for the uh, all-night prayer vigil that's coming up. You know the miracles that will happen because of that. You know the ways that you're going to move because of that. You've already seen it. You've already uh, made arrangements for your angels to be put into motion to take care of things as we pray about them. And we just pray that you'll play in a path for that and let us follow through on your will with that, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you'll be with our small groups. You know right now 
who's supposed to host small groups, what houses are supposed to be open for it, what people are supposed to step forward and lead small groups. You know, who in here in our body is supposed to be together in the same small group? And so, Lord, we just pray right now that you'll open people's hearts, that you'll uh, prevent any hardening of hearts so that the people will go to the small group that they're supposed to be in so they can grow in your word, they can encourage others to do good works and love and good deeds through you, Lord, and we can grow closer to you and closer to each other. And we ask all these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Duncan Davis at Impact Church. Thank you for listening today. We hope and pray that today's message has impacted your life for Christ. We pray that you'll impact others' lives for Christ. Come and fellowship with us at Impact Church on Sunday mornings at 1030. Have a great day and God bless you.